think uh, some of you in the group will know, and others not, that uh, myself, uh, Darren, who's not here, uh, Jen and uh, Martin all worked for Ronnie Fitch when we first started in our, embarked on our careers. So I think it's fair to say <coughs> probably that there wouldn't be a part if it wasn't for Ronnie Fitch. And I think... I'm not getting any royalties, eh? <laughs> 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 And uh, thereby, I think we started as a whole, and the four of us in particular, oh, Rodney, uh, a debt of gratitude. So thank you for, for that, Rodney. Um, I've got a few notes here because Rodney's career has uh, spanned about 40 years and um, has been very influential. Um, firstly, as the founder and chairman of Fitch, which he founded in 1972. And in 1982, um, Fitch became the first design group to list on the London Stock Exchange or go public, eventually opening up uh, eight offices across the, the US, Europe, um, the US, sorry, US, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. And during that career that spanned nearly 40 years, uh, or over 40 years, I think, um, Rodney's been very active in furthering design education and the arts. He's a senior governor at the University of Arts in London, um, which I think is the largest is it, arts college in the world, isn't it? Yeah. No, not in the world, but it's complicated. It's big. It's big. <laughs> um, he served as a member of the Design Council, um, the Council for the, Royal, for the RCA, for the Royal College of Art, was past president of the DNAD and the Chartered Society of Designers, and he's recently been appointed. Uh, the first professor of retail design at Delft University and will oversee um, an MA in retail design with an outreach program in Mumbai. And in 1990, Rodney was awarded a CBE for his services to British design. So this morning, Rodney's going to talk about his views on retail design, which I'm sure everybody will be very interested in. So thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you for that introduction. This little talk this morning is about my passion for retailing, and it's it was it's it's a, it's a cobbling together of, of, of two things that I did previously, and in its current form, it is a response to a wicked polemic written by a man called Neil Lawson. Put your hands up if anyone knows Neil Lawson. Thank God for that, because he's a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's, he's written a book called All Consuming, and anyone who's interested in retailing uh, ought to, um, uh, less in retailing and in shopping, ought to buy this little book, um, because it's a polemic against shopping. It accuses all of us who go shopping, and all of us who would be uh, perpetrators of, of shopping, uh, for causing the de virtual demise of the world. If there is such a thing as climate warming, which I doubt, but if there is, then it's been caused by you got up going shopping, according to Neil Lawson, you see. So this little cobbling together was a sort of uh, response to that. So I, um, um, I start with that uh, un unattributed um, little quotation, but I think in, in there there is a, a, a substantial truth which is that shopping is not just about the acquisition of things, products or services, but it is a major tool for forming, shaping and delivering different kinds of societies. There's no doubt that a huge number of people who go shopping, go shopping for reasons other than simply the acquisition of stuff. So the idea that shopping generates this thing called consumerism and that all shoppers are thick and stupid and all Tesco's and Waitrose's are wicked, sinful uh, perpetrators of consumerism rather than the deliverers at least of some kind of form of happiness um, is really the fundamental context for this, uh, this little, little talk. So I start with sort of four propositions. The first one is that shopping is the purpose of life. It's not design, it's not advertising, it's shopping. Going shopping 
is the purpose of life, and it always has been in its different shapes and forms, and I'll, I'll talk a little further about that in, in a moment. To be successful, uh, retailing must and always will mirror the society that it serves. If it doesn't mirror that society, then it can't be successful. No matter how pretty the shops, no matter how well merchandised they might have been, no matter how many designers might have worked on it, unless the store or the retailing format actually mirrors that society, then it simply doesn't work. Which is why many formats simply can't be exported from their home market, and why many um, are successful, because they are formats which do work in both America and in India, or do work in Brazil, or do work in somewhere else. But it's an interesting um, investigation when you look at just how, until really quite recently, it was very, very difficult to export um, home market formats, because they didn't mirror the society into which they were being placed. Um, one of the great phenomena in retailing and shopping in recent years is how the dissemination of information and the commonalization of the world makes the export of these um, formats so much more readily done. Which leads to the second great <coughs> diatribe in Neil Lawson's book, which is about the globalization of the world, i.e. It's not just that in Britain we've made all the high streets look the same. Now, you wicked designers and shopkeepers are making all the cities the same because the same formats are appearing in all the cities. And that is because our societies are becoming so homogenized. And that means that our retail formats work more readily from one place uh, to another. My third proposition is that the tectonic plates of world retailing are shifting and they are shifting uh, very dramatically. Um, if you take the other part of this uh, little talk which, which talks about India, um, uh, at the present moment in India, um, well up until recently in India, 95% uh, of all retailing took place in a space about a quarter the size of this room. Um, and there were something like 85 million people in India whose job it was to work in those little um, mom and pop stores, those little tiny independent stores. Because of what I said a moment ago on our second proposition, that's changing dramatically. It's going to put enormous numbers of people out of work. It's going to change society dramatically as the society that we used to know of in India changes and so the result of that is that all these tiny stores will change. So the tectonic plates <coughs> of retailing in India or in Russia, if you go there, yet alone in places like Dubai, are changing dramatically. Those tectonic plates of traditional forms of retailing and distribution are changing dramatically, and not least, of course, by technology. Again, we'll touch on that in, in, in a moment. And my fourth proposition is that innovation and the shopping experience are, are paramount. One size does not fit all. What worked yesterday certainly won't work tomorrow. You can guarantee that. Innovation, retailing is the most competitive organization in the world, industry in the world. Unless you innovate day in and day out with your format, with your merchandising, with your product and new product development, you will certainly be dead in no time at all. Um, not only is shopping the purpose of life, it's also one of the great drivers of, uh, of uh, change. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, that when I started in business, there was a wonderful conceit, um, firstly amongst retailers, who said that it was they who were changing society, i.e. the format, the new style of shopping, would drive changes in society and they would claim that they've changed society dramatically because they've opened a supermarket or something or opened a, a department store. Until um, the early 80s, that was probably true. The changes in society were 